Okay, so I have a series of equations here. We're going to talk about the Gibbs um, energy and sort of how does that relate to phase changes. And so I have a series of equations here, starting with um, this equation talking about the total entropy of a system. Um, and so we know that in order for a process to occur spontaneously, spontaneously, that the total entropy has is needs to increase, and it's going to take into account whatever the changes in, are occurring, the changes to the entropy of the system are occurring, and changes to the surroundings. At constant temperature and pressure, we can rewrite the equation so that we are now taking into account the entropy of the surroundings in terms of the enthalpy. This third equation is um, the Gibbs free energy equation, which is based on the change of the enthalpy and the entropy at some temperature. Uh, at the temperature that we're sort of dealing with for all of this. And so when we compare this to this equation, we can come up with this fourth equation that shows us that the change in Gibbs free energy is really telling us about the total entropy of the system. And, and so we now have a way to determine the spontaneity of a process based solely on the system. Um, and so we also see that they're going to have opposite trends because of this negative sign. And so if delta, if the change in entropy is positive, we know that that would be spontaneous. But for the Gibbs free energy, that's going to be a negative. Um, and same for if the change in entropy is um, negative, it's going to make the the change in free, Gibbs energy uh, make it positive. Um, however, if you know if your change in entropy is zero, then delta G is also going to be zero. Okay, so now how does our Gibbs ch uh, energy change for phase change? That is, when a substance is going between like gases, liquids, and solids. Um, and so we're going to refer to um, Gibbs as the molar Gibbs, which is really the Gibbs energy per mole of the substance. And so if we look at, and so we have um, this equation that tells us that the change in the molar Gibbs energy, so we have the M at the bottom telling us that it's molar, uh, is proportional to, is equal to the um, molar volume so the molar volume is the volume that one mole of the substance takes up, right? And so, and then times the change in the pressure. And so, and so we can, we have this graph over here on the right where we have molar Gibbs along the left. We have increasing pressure along the bottom. And so we can look at, we can see what's happening um, across the different phases. And so this has been mapped out for, um, for some substance. And so, and so the first trend that we're going to look at is that as the pressure goes up, so does our Gibbs molar energy. And so, um, and we can see for everything, pressure is low everything starts kind of lowish. And then as the pressure increases, everything starts to go up. And so our Gibbs energy increases as the pressure increases. Um, second, we see that, yes, solids are increasing, but they're not increasing very much. Liquids are increasing a little bit more, but gases seem to increase the most. And that's because, um, so our second trend is gases increase the most, but that's because they're going to take up the most volume when you have a mole of the substance. And so they're not compressed like liquids and solids. And so they're going to, um, and so this value is going to be the largest. And so we can see that, um, that is definitely if they have, it affects the molar, it gives energy the most. Um, and so, 
And so the last thing that we can sort of look at is, so, okay, so when we have these varying sort of ranges of pressure, what is the most stable phase going to be? And this might be a bit intuitive for you to think about, but um, let's look at these trends. And so in order for something to be spontaneous, um, in terms of entropy, we want it to have more entropy. For Gibbs energy, it's going to be the opposite. So we really want the lower Gibbs energy to be the most stable. So we can look at sort of this white region and we can see that the lowest Gibbs energy region is going to correspond to the gas. And so here we have gases being the most stable. As the pressure increases, the next thing is going to be liquids. And then at the highest pressure, it's going to be solids. Um, and so we can see sort of how the different phases would be, uh, would exist most naturally at these different pressures. And so this equation here on the left allows us to predict what phases would be the most stable at um, the different pressures for different substances. And so we can modify our equation a bit to adapt it for different phases. And so first we're gonna expand our delta G, uh, our molar Gibbs energy, and expand it to show that it's really the molar Gibbs energy of the final pressure, um, looking at the difference between the final pressure versus the molar Gibbs energy um, at the initial pressure. And then we also expand our change in pressure because it's our molar volume times whatever the difference in the pressures are. We arrange it a bit and we end up with these two equations. Um, the first one is essentially just this rearranged where we have the, we can, we can um, determine the molar Gibbs energy at the final pressure based off of the molar Gibbs energy at the initial pressure and then taking into account the change in pressure times the molar volume. And so we can use this form for liquids or solids because the molar volume is um, smaller. But we saw that the gases uh, are really affect how the molar Gibbs energy changes. And so we end up um, using a different form of that equation um, where instead we now have the Give, we start. We still start with the molar Gibbs energy at the initial pressure, but now we're taking the natural log of the final pressure uh, divided by the initial pressure, and then we multiply it by R, which is our gas constant, A314 joules per mole K, times the temperature in Kelvin. Um, and so what this tells us is that our molar Gibbs energy is going to increase logarithmically um, until at the highest pressures when the molar volume starts to drop and the Gibbs doesn't change as drastically. And so this is where we're getting this sort of curve where initially it changes a lot because the molar volume is small, but towards the end it starts to change less because the molar volume starts to or the, the molar volume is large. Yeah, the molar volume is large here. So it changes a lot, but the molar volume with the down here is smaller. And so it's changing a lot less. 